Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. The Clue Train Manifesto, an analysis of the nature of the internet with an eye to how successful businesses can be conducted in cyberspace, begins. Quote, people of Earth, a powerful global conversation has begun. Through the internet, people are discovering and inventing new ways to share relevant knowledge with blinding speed. As a direct result, markets are getting smarter, and getting smarter faster than most companies. These markets are conversations. Their members communicate in language that is natural, open, honest, direct, funny, and often shocking. Whether explaining or complaining, joking or serious, the human voice is unmistakably genuine. It can't be faked. Close quote. Predictions about the future of the internet abound. Claims range from less and less people-to-people -people connection will happen on the internet and it will become a worldwide web of appliances talking to each other. For example, smart refrigerators emailing repair shops when they need more Freon, to someday our very brains will be wired into the net, an instant person-to-person -person communication to anywhere on the globe will be possible. As e-commerce companies have seen their stocks plummet after the heyday of the late 1990s, many news services have discussed the supposed demise of the internet. In spite of the fact that it doesn't appear to be a get-rich-quick avenue, the Internet continues to be part of many people's everyday lives, and the number of people with access and interest is definitely growing. But is it one big conversation? Certainly, it has traditionally been a text-based world, and communication is at the cornerstone of this text. The term global conversation suggests a kind of unity that might be misleading. Conversation implies exchange. It doesn't take long to see that exchanges happen on the Internet. Talk in chat rooms, talk via email, talk posted on bulletin boards, talk on weblogs and online diaries, talk in news groups, talk on instant messaging services, and increasingly, these exchanges are audio and video based rather than simply text based. In her book, You Just Don't Understand, Women and Men in Conversation, linguist Deborah Tannen distinguished between report talk and rapport talk. Report talk occurs in public and is more akin to public speaking than to conversation, as speakers provide information about themselves without providing personal or private information. Rapport talk is more private and revealing, requiring a certain level of trust. Both report talk and rapport talk exist on the internet. In fact, it is quite surprising at times how truly revealing the conversation gets in what is essentially a huge public space. The French historical philosopher Michel Foucault observed that making a public confession has become an inherent part of Western culture. We are quite comfortable with both demanding and providing confessions in a number of social situations. Quote, the confession became one of the West's most highly valued techniques for producing truth. We have since become a singularly confessing society. The confession has spread its effects far and wide. It plays a part in justice, medicine, education, family relationships, and love relations, in the most ordinary affairs of everyday life, and in the most solemn rites. One confesses one's crimes, one's sins, one's thoughts and desires, one's illnesses and troubles. One goes about telling with the greatest precision whatever is most difficult to tell. One confesses in public and in private to one's parents, one's educators, one's doctor, to those one loves. One admits to oneself, in pleasure and in pain, things it would be impossible to tell to anyone else. 
the things people write books about. One confesses or is forced to confess. Western man has become a confessing animal. Close quote. The confession is not necessarily what one might think of as conversation. The power relationship between the confessor and the listener is not always reciprocal. Either the listener is more powerful than the confessor, demanding the confession and providing the means of absolution upon hearing the confession, as in religious, medical, and legal settings. Or the listener is less powerful than the confessor, often simply a passive vessel through which the message of the confession passes, such as the reader of a public diary, who may offer comment but generally is restricted to the topic chosen by the confessor and is meant to provide the supportive role of listening rather than that of an equal exchange. A better balance can be seen in Tannen's discussion of gossip and lamenting in talk between women. Specifically, she discusses rituals involving grieving. Quote, when the Greek women gather to share laments, each one's expression of grief reminds the others of their own suffering, and they intensify each other's feelings. Indeed, both Caravelli and anthropologist Joel Kuipers, who has studied a similar lament tradition in Bali, note that women judge each other's skill in this folk art by their ability to move others, to involve them in the experience of grieving. Expressing the pain they feel in losing loved ones bonds the women to each other, and their bonding is a salve against the wound of loss. Close quote. Tannen drew a parallel between these folk rituals and the ways in which North American and other European women employ troubles talk. This ritual strikes an interesting contrast to Foucault's confessing animal. Confession involves a top-down power relationship, which devalues the personal experience of the confessor by subjecting it to the gaze of philosophy, medicine, or religion, or devalues the personal experience of the listener by subjugating it to the agenda of the confessor. The purpose of telling the story is to remove it from the self and to find a rationalizing influence over the baser aspects of experience. Lamenting involves a shared power relationship, which values personal experience while making it central to social experience. The purpose of telling the story is to connect to others and to encourage them to connect to their own feelings of loss. In confession, the narrator finds absolution. In lamentation, the narrator finds community. Both confessions and lamentations occur on the net and are a large part of the cyber experience for many users. Both of these experiences on the internet support the Clue Train Manifesto's position that the internet is a global conversation, that the basic building block of the internet is conversation. But to suggest that such conversations constitute the major use of the internet is belied by the fact that the top 50 websites, in terms of page visits, are not conversational at all. They are much more oriented to performance. They are not confessional performances, but rather advertisements for the very things that one finds in other media. The mass media are not meant to be exchanges or conversations. They are meant to sell actively to a passive audience. There is an illusion of choice and interactivity, but it is a multiple choice test, with options limited to those things that promote the sale. The Clue Train Manifesto is suggesting that this kind of mass media will ultimately fail on the internet because of the perceived smartness of the market. But one wonders if the masses aren't already so familiar with the ritual of this kind of passive acceptance of information that they will not even think to resist it. However, critiques of mass media and attempts at providing alternatives are growing. Independent is a term used to denote materials other than those generated by a core of four or five media companies that control a great deal of content on the net. Those who create such material are called independents. Independents are not only becoming more plentiful on the internet, they are beginning to find ways to find each other and support each other. Many see hope for a global conversation emerging in these independents. The development of audio and visual technologies that are cheaper and more readily accessible 
is supporting these independent efforts. Internet radio, for example, has exploded with thousands of hobbyists worldwide who provide some sort of programming, often spoken word and often interactive in some form. But this growth is not unfettered. Governments, with pressure from these core companies, are struggling to control content through royalty payments and levies. Questions of intellectual property have become complicated and murky. Certainly things are not settled down, and it remains to be seen what the Internet of the future will be. This week, we spoke with Vancouver TJs, Sean Kennedy and James O'Brien, about the ins and outs of running their Internet radio station, called Red Radio, as we explore whether the Internet is one big conversation. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvic.ca. Giving sociology an edge! What do you find advantageous about internet radio versus terrestrial radio? Uh, why, for example, didn't you pursue co-op radio, for instance, CFRO in Vancouver, or have you thought about doing both? Well, the plan, plans for success. Plans for success. Plan to dominate the earth. Uh, well, uh, internet radio pretty much allows us to do anything we want, which is the large advantageous part of it. Yeah, it's about control. Uh, <laughs> whenever you work for, like, I don't know if you've ever listened to the co-op radio in Vancouver, but it's uh, pretty left-wing. And if you have any kind of, uh, it, it, in a way, some people would say, well, that's really, really good, but I think the pendulum swung, swung too far the other way. Uh, Rant Radio started out as just like a, a free medium for people to express their thoughts for people on the street, and uh, that's what made it popular. Uh, we, I suppose it would be safe to say that we never thought it would, you know, we were just screwing around, man, you know. We never thought it would get this incredibly huge. We never expected, you know, to wind up in Wired and Spin and uh, have fans all over the world and stuff. It was kind of a gag that started four years ago, and uh, it just took off. So at, when you ask, you know, would we pursue terrestrial radio, hey, if terrestrial radio gives us a call, probably. But I think that they might have a problem with uh, some of our content, just a hunch. But, yeah, uh, we're not used to sort of restricting ourselves too much to what uh, we what can and cannot say. And uh, also, Internet radio has... A huge audience. Massive like, no, following. Bigger no, than I thought. No restrictions at all. Like, you can let's do it anywhere in the world. And terrestrial radio, well, you're limited to the signal, unless you're uh, broadcasting over ham radio or something like that. So it's it's a pretty interesting it's a pretty interesting comparison. And in a lot of ways, yeah, they're similar, but in a lot of ways, too, they're kind of apples and oranges. Because, yeah, technically we are broadcasting. We're just using a different medium. But we have no governing body whatsoever, and that is the strength of Internet radio. Yeah, it's kind of nice. Uh, I know with... Uh, down in the states, there there is you're still governed by the same rules that are on the radio um, as on the internet radio. But up uh, up in Canada, so Canada's pretty got much given a free reign for to say whatever you want. Um, so which which is really how radio should, should be when you think about it. How, how right. any how any media should be. Like you're not forced to listen to it. It's not the yeah. gover government public uh, official. Loudspeakers oh, in the middle of every town. Absolutely, and you I'm gonna, can't turn the dial. Oh yeah, and, and I'm the first one to admit that you know perhaps 
that the rant radio or Sean Kennedy show should not be played to the kindergarten class. I'm, <laughs> I'm the first guy in line with that. Uh, but you, you've got a, you know, it's it's something that's there, and it's a it's a viable medium, and I think it's a great alternative to what people are currently experiencing with media, and they're very frustrated. And uh, I think people are seeking out uh, types of radio like rant radio. You can see in the, the change in television attitudes towards sort of real TV type shows yeah. where things are realistic, but they're still not getting the realistic that they need, right? It, all those shows are still scripted, but when they come to Rant Radio, it, it's just us, us on the microphone, unscripted, unrestricted. Complete, completely live, and like I've said on the air before, uh, we feel that why our model, our model, our business model, why we feel <laughs> that uh, Rant Radio is, is going to be even more successful within the coming years is because... Uh, following that trend where you have all these real TV and Survivor and all this crap that's on television, uh, it's becoming more and more apparent that honesty is going to be pornography of the 21st century. And that's where people want. They want something real. They want something tangible, something that's not totally prefabricated, form-fitted, polished, and then uh, packaged. They want something that's real. You've mentioned that your programming is geared toward providing people with a form in which to express their ideas. I've taken a look at your website, and you seem to have about two hours a day of spoken word programming versus about 22 of uh, pre-recorded music. And you say on your site that you're interested in acquiring more talk, uh, what would you call them, talk jockeys, I suppose, TJs. Right. What are your plans for programming in the future? Is this part of it? Definitely, definitely. We, we uh, love the talk shows. They're very, very popular and uh, almost even more so than the music. More people tune in. And uh, I think they're great. And But I'm very, very picky about the, the, the stuff that does go on the station. It has to be very high quality, um, something that uh, and, and people we, would be interested in. We do have a set of, we do have certain moral standard guidelines, <laughs> which we've, we've thrown up, because when you take away all restrictions, you get every, you know, schizo in the seven straights showing up wanting to do a show. What is your relationship with SoCan? You mentioned them briefly. Do all the artists with music on your station just sign off on the royalties, or is there some other legal loophole that protects you from having to answer to SOCAN for everything you do? Well, I have a love-hate relationship with SOCAN. Mostly hate. Mostly hate at this moment. But uh, before, uh, they started, well, they've been uh, trying to hammer on us with the Tariff 22 for a while since, uh, I believe, 1996. But on the other hand, SOCAN's been very liberal with the uh, uh, stuff you can put on the radio, on internet radio in Canada, or even radio itself, uh, by giving a free reign to do whatever you want on the radio. But uh, as of right now, they're trying to implement uh, Tariff 22. As as a lot of people know, I've been uh, campaigning against Tariff 22 for the style of radio that I'm doing, which is a hobby-style radio. We've got uh, things in place, like you mentioned, the artists giving us full permission to store and play their music. Yeah, there's no illegal music whatsoever on Rant Radio. Everything we have here, as a matter of fact, the artists who so can is so you know uh, supposed to be protecting and looking out for the best interest for these artists are absolutely rabid to have the exposure that Rant Radio gives them. Um, they well, love it. They, they they put links up on their pages to Rant Radio. It's just like, uh, generally, we talk to the artists, the artists say it's cool. I really don't understand why SoCan's even involved. If we've contacted each and every artist and we have written permission from them, what's the big deal? Hands off. That's right. Now, and we can, we've got things in place so we can take it to a point where SoCan can't even get involved. Um, if they force us out of the country, that, that might happen, right? But we don't want to leave, uh, leave the country in terms of our broadcasting. Yeah, but rest assured that Rant Radio will, like... In one form or another, we will stay up. It, yeah, even if it turns into a bunch of guys driving around in a van broadcasting pirates, that's what it's going to turn into, but it won't stop. And the style of music that we broadcast, uh, they're very supportive of it. Uh, it's uh, industrial music, EBM, synth pop, and these are bands that don't get exposed on any radio station or any television station, like... Uh, even the mega giants, even the mega yeah. giants in the uh, in the synth pop world, like KMFDM and things like that, they get exposure through movie soundtracks. Uh, Ministry, whatnot, has had exposure through movie soundtracks. You got other bands out there who are equally of good quality, uh, SPF 1000 and whatnot, who are amazing bands, put out uh, uh, unbelievable quality of music, yet they cannot get radio play because of the style of music they play. How is running an internet radio station in Canada different from running one in the United States? People can listen to internet radio from just about any place that there's a phone line. 
but you have to run it from somewhere. You have to broadcast from somewhere, and invariably geographical considerations come into play. You must have been following what's been going on in the States to a great extent. In, Go ahead. In, in terms of where you're broadcasting from, uh, it doesn't really matter a whole lot except for the, the, the government, the governing body of, in terms of taxing you and the artists. But we have, uh, it doesn't really matter where we're broadcasting from because we've got mirrors all over the world uh, from people who are setting up rebroadcast stations for us. Um, say over in Europe and in the States and all over the world, Australia, Australia and stuff like that, um, for other people to listen in locally. So it doesn't, uh, the, the where we're located really doesn't have much of an effect onto it except for the originating broadcast, which is how Tariff 22 and CARP in the States is going after. So if we move that, then it, it's irrelevant, really. We could move the originating broadcast to Europe. The best way to put it would be to say that Rant Radio is not so much a station as it is a community, and the community is global. Therefore, Rant Radio is global. So it really doesn't matter where particular laws in particular countries move. Rant Radio will be able to go sideways and go to any country they need to in order to keep the quality of broadcast up. Yeah, hence how the whole Internet works. It's, it's kind of ridiculous trying to govern the Internet when it's a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, they can give it the good college try, though. I saw an interview in the Globe and Mail in July in which one of you was talking about your no revenue, no plans to get any business model, and I thought you might be willing to share some of your secrets with us. It's clear just by going to your site that you have enormous pipeline at your disposal, and I thought you might have come up with some secret way to assure sustainability. Yeah, you bet. Any tips on that? Oh, you betcha. Be honest. <laughs> Ask people. That's uh, the, the only secret there is. Uh, we started out small. We provided a good quality product, which was the shows, and uh, people liked it. Um, we were more, more than often or not, we were offered the bandwidth because there are so many hungry people out there looking for entertainment that's not part of the infotainment industry, that's not part of the core political. That is what MGM, what Time Warner, what all these companies have become. People are sick of that, and uh, people are not stupid. People are not wanting to sit back and watch friends all the time. There's a whole other culture of people that want something that's real and tangible, and Rant Radio has been, ca has been catering to that culture, and that's why we've been growing. We've been growing and providing the bandwidth because the market is giving it to us because they are that hungry. The problem, one of the reasons why Rant Radio started and came on as strong as it is is because we did not like the current media. If you hate the media, become the media. So that's exactly what we did. We became the media, and as, you, as it's very, very apparent from the site, from the feedback, from the global response, it's clearly a desire is there for that. And every single episode, every single day, Rant Radio gets stronger. And, and like Sean touched on before, it is a community. Effort. Very much. Very, like, very, Rant, very much. Rant Radio is not Sean and me. It's everyone who listens, everyone who contributes art, the, the mirrors, the, the music, the... Uh, the, the audio things that people send in, it's, it's a, a community effort, and uh, people have donated all this bandwidth that we have. It's, it's not we... Purely for accolades. We simply stand back and we go, wow, this person did this, thank you very much, and we're honest about it. And when, you're, when you have that degree of honesty, when things are not scripted, when it's not, you know, can I get this icon in cornflower blue, when it's not that level of, of crap... People can feel that. They can feel it over the airwaves. They can feel it in real life, and it's real emotion. And that is what makes Rant Radio strong, is that it is unscripted and that it is unregulated. That's why we were able to grow at the rate we have been, because the demand is there. And people are not stupid. They recognize what the truth is. Oh, They, I, they can tell. Yeah, completely. It's, it's pure honesty on the air all the time. You've talked a little bit about the community that sprung up around this. What kind of community building have you done? I've seen some of the listener picks on the site. Do you have other things, scheduled events, face-to-face -face meetings, that enable you to get in touch with your listener base and bring it all together a little better? From time to time, I do put up uh, events. There is an events section. It's uh, not too often. Because of the nature of the station, people are spread out all over the world, like Australia and in the States. There are listener parties, though. There, there, are, there are listener parties. People have set up listener parties, and we do have a section in the forum for that for people to get together and meet, and they also, uh, people get together to listen to the shows that we broadcast, so there is, there is a community effort, but it's sort of self-organized, and Rant Radio extends more than just the radio station, too. It's far extending. It's, it's really, it is a community. It's, it's an idea. It's actually kind of staggering.
staggering how much work we do for free <laughs> when, you're, when you really it sit is. back and think about it. I mean, much all our free time. Yeah. So it's it's a uh, yeah. <laughs> now that you mention it, holy crap! <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot we do. So and uh, people have been very receptive. And to be honest with you, we cannot keep up with demand. The demand is so heavy for us to if if we so it's it's really we don't run Rant Radio. Rant Radio runs us. So that's pretty much how that works. And also, uh, lots of people over the years have uh, tried to get our station or our shows broadcast over their. Uh, college radio right. stations, yep. their their uh, high school radio stations, uh, they rebroadcast it. They try to. They usually get shut down pretty quick because of our, <laughs> of our, of our content. That would be my fault, yeah. <laughs> but uh, they 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 want to spread what we're doing out there because they believe in it and they they know our our integrity holds true. That uh, yeah, we've got four years. We were here before the dot com boom. We were here after the dot com crash, and we're still broadcasting. How do you see the project expanding in the future? Where do you plan to go from here? You've mentioned branching out into video, into um, internet television. What other media might you pursue, do you think? Whatever media shows up. If we get 3D rendering technology, <laughs> we'll do 3D rendering. If we can do video, we'll do video. If we can do Omnimax, we'll do Omnimax. We'll do it all. We'll, we'll put ourselves in movie theaters. We'll put ourselves on TV. It's, it's whatever is offered to us, really, without changing the ideals of what we do right now. Yeah. Uh, we, we wouldn't. We wouldn't want to change ourselves to fit into somebody else's box. Who came up with the name Rant Radio? Ooh, well, I came up with a logo. Well, that's a good good question. It's sort of formed out of uh, yeah, just well, a, a cloud of things. Like, well, I, I met Sean and uh, <laughs> yeah, a, a while back, just before the station started up. And, one lifetime uh, ago. Uh, one uh, lifetime ago, and, and Sean is good at talking. He talks all day long and gets really excited about things. And it's, it's a practice thing. And and I've always wanted to run a radio station. I was going to do a pirate before over the air. That's too expensive and too easy to get caught. And uh, I thought, incorporate Sean's enthusiasm and my idea into one big idea. And uh, Sean used to go off on rants. And I said, Sean, you should... People should hear you. More people. Yeah, rather than just freaking out on the people in the in the Safeway lineup, maybe you should do it into a microphone. Yeah, okay, that's a good idea. So Rant and Radio put it together, and uh, the domain name was available, so I picked Rant Radio, and there was no other Rant Radio on the Internet. So bear in mind, this is back in... 99. Yeah, when there was domains available. Yeah. <laughs> as opposed to now when, you know... No deva- domains available. Yeah, everything's pretty much been, been nailed down. Uh, it... Yeah, when you look back, it almost makes you think of some weird kind of karma thing, how it all sort of worked out, but... Uh, it just all came together, really. Yeah, so there was no... The, the, the rant in Rant Radio was Sean, Sean's ranting, right? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and the radio came from me. Yeah. So it came together, and uh, both of us make one... Uh, Maybe we should do that on the business cards. We'll have, we'll have Sean Kennedy rant, and on you we'll have Sumerian Radio. radio. Yeah, yeah little... so the radio and Rant Radio. But that's pretty much how it works. Uh, I've, I've always had a mind for, for content, how things sound. I'm a very visual thinker. So the artistic, uh, a lot of the conceptual stuff that floats around in my head, you know, it's kind of like I'm the Keith Richards and, and uh, James is the studio. Yeah. So I can, like, puke into a microphone and James can make it sound amazing, which is kind of nice. So. <laughs> so the combination works very, very well together. Yeah, it's, it's, and we've worked together for so long now that uh, I'm currently plotting to kill James. <laughs> <laughs> we've worked together for so long that it's kind of second nature now like uh the two of us could have a conversation with a third person it's not like we're on the radio 24 7 hi how's it going very good how are you we're good thanks you know it's just it's it's almost sad but it's it's a lot of fun well i found out most of what i wanted to know if you have anything you'd like to add now would be a good time yeah we're currently looking for people to build us genetically engineered two-headed cats and giant robots that's part of our biggest bigger business model we told the guys in in uh, Wired Magazine about that, because they gave us a, a <laughs> great interview. Uh, awesome guys. From uh, If you do a search for Pump Up the Bandwidth on the Wired site, you'll, you'll find it. But it, they never put it in the interview, but they're great <laughs> guys. And they said, what's your business plan for the future? And we said, we're going to take over the Earth with genetically engineered two-headed cats and giant robots. I think and we they, told Spin that, too. And yeah, they didn't we told, print that either. Print that either. <laughs> so if you printed that, that'd be great, <laughs> because no one else seems to have the guts to print that. It, it, it upsets us, too, because it's a perfectly good business model. Even the guys from Wired, after they stopped laughing, they said it was the best goddamn business model they'd heard in years. Yeah. So, I mean, nobody else is doing it, so why not? Yeah, you know, really, because there's a market for giant robots. I I really think so. (laughs) James O'Brien and Sean Kennedy, thank you for being with me today. Well, thank you very much, Carl, and we look forward to hearing it. I tried 
talking about the internet and the Clue Train Manifesto's assertion that cyberspace is one big conversation. You know, I've heard musicians talk about being in tune with the one big song. Uh, as a way of saying that they're sort of in sync with the world when they're writing good music. But I'm having a hard time thinking of the internet as one big conversation. Though I kind of like the idea. What do you mean by one big conversation? Well, I, well, I guess it isn't really me that said it. It's uh, the Clue Train people. I think what they were trying to get at was the social nature of the internet, 
anytime there's a conversation going, anytime language is involved, it's inherently social. We don't, we're not born knowing language. And because we're not born knowing language, at least one other human being had to enter our lives to teach it to us. So if we're using language, even when we're talking to ourselves, we're doing a social act. And of course, language comes with culture. And we wouldn't know what each other meant if we didn't have a common culture. The problem I have with this whole great idea is that the internet is chock full of ways of shutting you up. What do you mean? Well, for one thing, there are lots and lots of people who are wanting to make lots and lots of money, and they would like to dominate the internet. Uh, we've seen this stuff with internet radio in the last year with the United States Librarian of Congress coming through and making a decision that essentially, though not directly, killed quite a few radio outlets on the internet. At least in the United States. Yes. But we also have the SOCAN stuff going on here in Canada that has the potential to do very similar damage. And while SOCAN is a nicer organization in my mind than the recording industry of America, what's RIA stand for again? I don't recall. I just refer to it as the oligopoly. Yes. It saves time. There's got to be another A in there. The Recording Industry of America. Association of America, perhaps? Associ oh, yeah, Recording Industry Association of America. There we go. Anyway, uh, SOCAN is a little bit more democratic than RIAA. RIAA is basically a club that you have to have a lot of money to belong to, and it's meant to make more money for you after you join it. Um, SOCAN actually spreads the money around a little bit more. Having said that, though, it still seems antithetical to this big conversation that we're all supposed to be having on the net. Yeah, it does tend to put a damper on everyone's fun. Yeah, I kind of have a, a love-hate relationship with the internet. On the one hand, I think that it truly could be a democratic place. And on the other hand, every time I see democracy at work, it seems like you run into just a lot of idiocy. I've often wondered how one stops democracy from becoming ruled by the stupid, if you'll excuse the reference. I've often wondered what the best way to deal with the lowest common denominator problem is. And I guess the best way to deal with it is to point out that there are lots of other ideals besides democracy that need to be balanced off against democracy. See, I think that democracy may be the sum of all those ideals instead of being balanced off of it. I think that the United States, at least, and to a certain extent Canada, have kind of forgotten what democracy means, and they've reduced it down to majority rules or everybody gets a piece of the pie and neither one of those is is true in the United States well not just that witness but we, well, the 2000 presidential election yeah witness the most uneven distribution of income and wealth on earth after the Brazilians yes there was somebody who beat us beat them we're in Canada now <laughs> <laughs> won't they find us here it seems like, especially with internet radio, you see this, though, certainly with a bunch of different websites as well, a whole bunch of people who want to play the oligopoly music and are just so, so upset that now that the ruling has come through, they have to pay money to play. And then you have a whole bunch of people who are doing what on the surface seems pretty radical. You know, they're negotiating contracts with 
different independent artists and they're promoting independent artists and independent websites and so forth and it seems like they're fighting it but then they start creating this kind of it's sort of like what the baffler calls deviance incorporated it basically becomes there's only one way to be deviant there's only one way to show your distaste and it just turns into just one more way to conform just faddishness yeah it's kind of like when we were talking about makeover and how punk rockers have this tendency to all look alike because you have to figure out what image it is that you've got to portray to show that you don't want to be portraying an image. Which seems paradoxical and indeed hopeless on the face of it. Yes. So it's just, I don't know, it's just sort of craziness. And I feel kind of caught in the middle. I'm not necessarily wanting to reject all things corporate. I, I certainly don't want to reject the idea that maybe I'd like to make a living at this. But on the other hand, I'm very uncomfortable with a lot of the corporatism that goes on in the net. Well, it's like getting bullied from both sides, really. It's like being bullied by the popular kids on one end of the school ground and being bullied by the cool thugs on the other side of the school ground. You are, in fact, just as much a cultural stereotype as the first group. Yeah. Who are essentially more close to that first group than they would ever be able or willing to admit. I to the me the loyal opposition. Yes. Yeah. To me the com the conversation that we should be having ought to be an open book. It ought to be something that a lot of people, a lot of different people can come to the table. And you know, I hear the I hear people talk about oh the internet is so wonderful because it's global. Well it ain't global. There's quite a few people on this planet who don't even have access to a telephone, much less a computer with the internet. I don't think that's global. And I think that it's a privilege. It's a nice little privilege that I'm happy to have, but it's a privilege and I don't fool myself into believing that just because I'm on the internet, it means that a lot of other people get to be on the internet too. There are quite a few people on this planet who don't even know that the internet exists. Similarly for television, telephones, radio, go on down the list, you'd be surprised what they don't have in most of the world. Yes, telecommunications is a very wealth-oriented thing, even if you're pretty poor while you have it. You know, we like to think of ourselves as really scraping by because we don't make money and we use $5 tape recorders and you know, older computers, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, this is still a very privileged territory that we're in. There are times when I really love the internet because it seems to be a place where people meet each other. I've met people, I know people who I have never seen, and I actually feel closer to them than I do to a lot of people that I see on a daily basis because we share emails together, we read each other's web logs, we talk about things that are really important to us. And I like that aspect of the web. But I have to tell you that I have had a hard time finding the web as a friendly place. And I think one of the reasons that it isn't that friendly is because I'm not a little boy. I, I think that there is a whole lot on the net that is just little boys playing King of the Hill and doing pissing contests. Now, don't get me wrong, I think there are a lot of nice guys on the net. I think there are guys out there who are doing some really sweet things. I think there are guys out there who are doing some really tough things. But I think there are also a whole bunch of guys on the net who are just bullying away they're playing Deviants Incorporated and they think they're little tough guys and they like picking on the rest of us. And frankly, I'm too old for that. I don't really like playing that game anymore. And you can't tell when you first start who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Because a lot of them say the same things that we say. 
A lot of them talk about the oligopoly. A lot of them talk about resistance. A lot of them talk about culture jamming. A lot of them talk about all sorts of good things. And then you get involved with it, and it turns out what they really want to do is just another little pissing contest. And frankly, I, I sometimes think of the net as a fallow net. I really do. That's a word that you and I invented independently this afternoon. But it is. I mean, it's just this little power game that goes on. Don't you think? I was absolutely knocked out when I first realized the scope of the Internet. And this was long before browsers were at their current opulent state. It was around 94 when I first started to get really intrigued by it. And it was almost all text-based then. Pictures were few and far between. You had to have the right browser to view them. And sound just wasn't available. And my thought was, oh my goodness, the media is finally democratized. Or something like it. The media was more democratized anyway. No longer did we have to submit magazine articles to a member of my favorite group, the Media Oligopoly, <laughs> and get their approval to have them published and circulated. I was absolutely blown away. I thought it was the millennium. Six years later, by the time the millennium did in fact come around, I began to, I had realized that people with computers have nothing to say. It's really scary, isn't it? It really is. I mean nothing. I mean content free. And I could not come up with an explanation for it. I really don't understand what's going on, but the norm in cyberspace is for the noisiest, most content devoid loser to take over every discussion. And it's, it's either spams, it's either spamming or idiocy. I swear it is. And or great, flame wars. Yeah. And that's all it's for. That's yeah. all it's for as far as I can tell. There are people in this world who apparently find it necessary to disagree with everything. And these people have all the time and energy in the world. I don't know who's funding them, and I don't care. All I know is that they poison everything else. And I used to be very much an anarchist when it came to the media. I felt everyone should be able to contribute to it. Yes. And I suppose I still am. I think that everyone should have their 15 minutes of fame, or at least their 15 minutes on the podium. But I'm past the point where I personally want to listen to most of it. Because most of it is either going to be the same seven sentences over and over, or it's going to be complete schizo babble. It's going to be people getting up and just talking at random, the way they apparently type at random on the internet. And I remember being very disappointed by that. I realized the internet wasn't democratic. I realized that most people do not have a computer. Yeah. And most people have a computer. Well, no, that isn't true anymore. A lot of people do have access to the internet. And I wouldn't, I'm not sure that most people who have computers do not. I am sure of this. You've got to dig a lot of dirt to get to the diamonds. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. There are some diamonds out there, but it's tough to find them. It really is. And for the life of me, I don't know why. I don't know why people wouldn't take more care with their content. But instead, the contest seems to be about who can type the most words. And I absolutely couldn't believe it. I actually... Well, I, sh I should skip to the end on this. We're running short on time. I've been asked many times whether I think uncontrolled media, a la the Internet, or controlled media, a la the media oligopoly, is what I prefer. Whether I prefer, to use the academic language, referee journals, or... Actually, I don't know the academic language. What's the <laughs> companion term? Uh, I don't think there is a companion term. Everything in academia is referee journals. I guess... Popular publications might be the antonym of that. They I guess either bulletin, write bulletin boards, I suppose, but that's not, not really a good analog. But the point is, do I want somebody doing the editing, or do I just want anyone to be able to come and stick something up? And in 1994, I would have said the latter, without question. Let's get the control out of there entirely. But I, I greatly overestimated the intelligence of the American public, and apparently the public in the rest of the world as well. And I hate to say well, English speaking world anyway. We don't yeah, hang out I, uh, much on the internet beyond English. I pay some attention to the French internet, but that's the extent of it. Two languages was quite enough for me. And I was just very disappointed in what the standards came out to be. But 
anyway, the answer to the big question, which is refereed or non-refereed journals, is both. If you have only one kind, a certain number of terrible things are going to happen. If you have both, then you have some kind of balance. And you need a warning label right at the beginning. Not a warning label of whether it's refereed or not, but, you know, warning stupid material on this site or something like that. I swear, I, I'd love to invent, like, a stupidity filter. <laughs> you can just... I think that's from Dober. Scott Adams talks about a Boza filter in one of his books that'll take emails that are of limited or no value and consign them to the dustbin before he even has a chance to look at them. Oh, what a beautiful invention that would be. Yeah, and they have spam bloggers to a certain extent now. Well, fool that I was, I thought that most people, quote, most people, close quote, when the Internet first came into my life, were going to follow the same standards that I did. That is, don't put anything on the Internet that isn't at least near publication quality. You don't have to have somebody proofread it for you, but don't put it on the net if you wouldn't want somebody to read, to judge you by this. If you wouldn't want somebody to look at this and say, okay, this is his peak work. Well, my opinion, my policy, despite following the categorical imperative, that's something for you Kant fans in the audience, <laughs> is such a minority policy that I'm beginning to think I'm the only person in the world who feels this way, as usual. Yes. The norm is so much for people just to type as fast as they can and get as many words out as possible with no concern over content at all that I've lost a lot of faith in it. I've noticed a corollary opposite problem going on and on, and that is people have stopped reading email too. I cannot tell you the number of emails I get returned to me with some sort of reply that essentially indicates that they have read one line the first line of the email and nothing else and it makes me wonder if if people just haven't stopped reading it because it's also stupid that you can't get through the static either direction you can't get through the static by listening or reading and you can't get through the static by writing because what happens is is that nobody wants to read more than a two line email it just it seems like there's too much static floating around now well, we don't want to end this on too pessimistic a note. It's still possible that democratization can be good as well. I just don't see how the media oligopoly can be the solution. But I'll say this as well. People have always said and done stupid things, and it may be that the only thing the Internet has changed is that it has allowed them to archive every damn one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's a scary thought. Person Plural, your source for soothing sounds of sociological sagaciousness. The police state is using its phallocentric organ, the corporate media, to control ordinary people like you and me. been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable and CFUV.UVIC.CA. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson.
music for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural, or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com.